Welcome to the Diversity Pivot Podcast. I'm your host, Julie Kratz. I am thrilled you are here with us today. Our purpose is to share stories, ideas, and tools to help you on your diversity, equity, and inclusion journey. Let's meet this week's guest. Welcome to the Diversity Pivot Podcast. I am thankful that a friend and ally, Stephen Graves, is joining us today, and he's a DEI workplace culture and health equity consultant, facilitator, and strategist. He has over a decade of experience partnering with organizations of all sizes across sectors to add value and that ROI through his work on leadership, DEI, health equity, talent management, and organizational development. His previous experience was at the Medical University of South Carolina and Novant Health and University of Vermont Medical Center. And throughout his career, he's demonstrated dedication and expertise in leading and managing DEI assessments, data reporting, DEI strategic planning, language access initiatives, and employee resource group development DEI education, learning, and dialogues on cultural humility. Driven by his faith, Stephen understands and harnesses the power of collective conscious and collective intellect to make a positive impact on the life lives of others. Stephen, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Julie. Uh, so excited to dig in uh, the equity pieces, the cultural pieces, so intriguing the work you do. But before we dig in, I'd love to just know more about your background. How did you manage the migration from, you know, quote unquote, corporate or, you know, regular day job type of work, all this in air quotes, listeners, um, to the DEI world doing this now on in, in your own world, in your own business? Yeah, so I, I guess my story starts, there's three parts to it, and it starts with my early years. So um, you heard that word faith as a part of my my bio, and it starts from that faith-based institution. So I was raised in uh, the Black Baptist Church. Uh, it's the church, Mount Moriah Baptist Church. Um, sh- shout out to my church family. Um, but in Greenwood, South Carolina, I attended uh, and was a member of this church um, throughout my early years and even the present day. And about half a mile away from that church, there was another church called uh, First Mount Moriah Baptist Church. And that was a predominantly white congregation, whereas the one that I was a member of was predominantly Black. And that's when questions started to arise for me um, on a personal level. I was asking my parents frequently, week to week, every Sunday, what does first mean? Why are they first? You know, um, why are they first of all God's children? Uh, you know, why don't we combine the churches? So it kind of sent me on this exploration, a uh, personal exploration uh, throughout my adolescent years. So, you know, going into middle school, high school, I was just asking and I had an insatiable appetite to just find answers to what does all of this mean? What do what does these differences mean and how do they show up in in the worlds and the the spaces that I exist in, whether it's in school, on the playgrounds and friendships. And on a subconscious level, I think that's where, for me, I started thinking of what would this look like to make this my work and what I do um, as far as a professional calling of sorts. And uh, that was amplified through um, an internship that I completed my during my senior year at um, Lander University, and I was in my hometown of Greenwood. And I com- interned with an organization uh, called Burton Center for Disabilities and Special Needs. And that's when I started seeing that in an organizational context, what it could look like to advocate with um historically marginalized groups and historically excluded communities. And in this case, it was people with disabilities. And, you know, the Burton Center, their their whole business model was really focused on providing essential services. So um, that gave me a lot of insight. And then, you know, fast forward a couple of years later, I was pursuing my master's at the Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston. And a couple of touch point moments that really stood out for me, again, to think about what this looks like in a quote unquote uh, corporate setting as well as an institutional setting was uh, one experience was um, during my first year of grad school, I remember a professor showing us a statistic that 
Uh, black Medicare patients were three times more likely to have leg amputation resulting from diabetes. And he said, you know, your charge as future healthcare leaders and leaders in general would be to address and fix disparities like this. So that was one moment that stood out for me in terms of, okay, if I'm going to be inside of a system, an institution, this is kind of the work that we're supposed to be doing. A second touch point for me, I had the blessing to be introduced to a man by the name of Anton Gunn. And Anton was MUSC, Medical University of South Carolina Health's first chief diversity officer. And in that role, he was charged with leading, building, and cultivating a culture of DEI um, in the workplace and throughout the community and throughout the uh, Charleston community. And Anton opened my eyes to not only the work of DEI, but the work of organizational culture and how that could be a professional path. So, you know, I worked and partnered with Anton on a number of initiatives. And um, it, again, it kind of set forth my path into to doing this work professionally inside organizations. So from there, you know, one thing led to another. I was able to complete an administrative fellowship at um, Novant Health in Charlotte. Um, as well as uh, working in, in Burlington, Vermont, for a couple of years uh, with the University of Vermont Medical Center. Um, in terms of the biggest difference, I guess the transition, I was, as I was doing the work inside of an organization, I realized that there is inevitably going to be um, so much that you can do inside. And that there's, um, especially when you're a member of a historically marginalized, excluded group, you also kind of feel a sense of not being um, as liberated, if you will, as you would like to be, right? And I had the blessing, the privilege, opportunity to kind of make that transition out of um, the kind of corporate world, if you will, to being on the edge of the inside and kind of having a foot inside, but also having the liberty to pursue this calling and this work kind of on my terms. So that's how I've been able to make the transition. And I think another important thing to mention in terms of that transition, I was fortunate to be surrounded by so many other DEI practitioners in this space and consultants. Um, I completed a program in 2018, uh, 2018, 2019 through Georgetown University. Uh, they had a DEI certificate program, and it was there that I was able to cultivate relationships with um, other professionals in this space. And that also helped motivate me to, to pursue this outside of, you know, kind of the regular nine to five. So, yeah. Yeah. Cause it's not like uh DEI is a traditional career path. Right. <laughs> I've, I've heard um, that we're getting more and more, well, I know we're getting more and more certifications like that available um, and college degrees even in DEI. So that gives me hope for the future, but for folks like you and I, you know, in the early days of DEI, it was just kind of like, uh, can I do this for a living? And then you got to see, you know, Anton, in your example, do it. It's like, oh, this could actually be a thing. And sometimes you have to see it to believe it. And I appreciate you sharing um, an early childhood experience about segregation, like just a light bulb of like, hmm, there's something going on here, right? And that I presume was not all too long ago. And people like to think our racial past is in the past, but uh, your story illustrates how it's very much still active today um, through people's experiences. Um, Stephen, I wonder this whole idea of where you left off with finding this community, with the Georgetown Certificate Program and connecting with the other DEI practitioners, professionals, why is that so important? For me, it's important because when, again, when you're a member of a historically excluded group, and I think of, so when I use that term, you're thinking black and brown folks, you're thinking people with apparent, non-apparent disabilities, members of the LGBTQ plus community, just um, veterans, um, you're, you're experiencing an additional tax, right? So there's obviously stress with every sort of job and career path that you enter. But when you're talking about some of the topics and delving into some of the topics that we delve into as practitioners, there's a double and sometimes triple and sometimes quadruple burden that comes with that. 
And it's so important that you have folks to lean on, to grind with, to um, be there to support and, and support each other, because there's only a select few. And this is, you know, in the DEI industry, um, there's only so many of us who are doing this work and everybody is not going to kind of get it in terms of uh, what goes with the the pain and the heartache and the, <laughs> the, you know, burdens that come with it. So I think that's why it's so important to find your community and find um, that group of folks who, again, who you can lean on, because um, otherwise you're, I mean, you're going to run yourself into the ground trying to to do it uh, kind of a lone ranger approach, if you will. And I just think it's uh, antithetical to the the essence of this work and how to do it um, in terms of when we think about dominant culture norms, the dominant culture tells us, well, you have to be the sole person to do this and you have to do it by yourself. And especially in a capitalistic society, if you will, that gets reinforced so many times. So I think it's a way to model what we're uh, practice, what we're preaching, modeling, what we're teaching in terms of building a community and sustaining the community to find that support and to, to you know, to re-engage and re-motivate ourselves and re-energize as needed. So, Yeah. 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 It's so important that we build that connection and community and you're right. Like, it's not natural inside organizations for diversity leaders, DEI folks to feel that kind of connection, which always seems to me like extremely ironic. Like, how are we the ones that are championing inclusion, but we don't feel included? <laughs> like, right. so many practitioners over the years have shared with me, like, I'm like the diversity police when I show up at a meeting, you know, like, I'm going to get people in trouble. And that's certainly not the motivation but it feels like that sometimes. I, I wonder, Stephen, for organizations and DI leaders that I suspect are like, yeah, this connection thing sounds great, but like, how do I do it? How do we create these psychologically safe places for folks in DEI to connect? One of the examples that and practices that I've incorporated is the idea of having open spaces for dialogue. And sometimes, you know, and this is something that we've seen over the last few years in DEI, we know that unconscious bias trainings and, you know, the standard two-hour training doesn't always work. But something that I'm starting to experiment more and more with and something that I see working is this idea of having ongoing conversations. So what that looks like in practice is holding monthly or bi-monthly listening sessions. And essentially you have um, maybe one to two topics that you're engaging employees on and it's an open forum. And sometimes it can be a town hall style. Sometimes it's a moderated conversation with a couple of panelists, but the the key is to engage your, your group and to engage your employees. And these are uh, environments where all employees are invited and, you know, you start the conversation with just a general set of ground rules and expectations for how to enter the conversation. And then you just, you know, use prompts to, to generate that dialogue. And I've seen that work effectively to uh, provoke thought and eventually is, you know, to provoke action. Because from these conversations, leaders can gather uh, qualitative data of sorts to be able to say, OK, we can. Uh, you know, apply this strategy, or maybe we need to refine this approach or process to better meet the needs of our employees. And again, I think there's a power um, in doing that and, and in, in the collective voice, right, and, and making space for that to be done. Uh, because, you know, ideally, you would want your, your leaders, your managers, your supervisors to, to kind of hold that space, team meetings, weekly uh, one-on-ones, but sometimes that's not always the case. And sometimes, you know, because of this grind culture that we live we live in, we're not always able to do that. So dedicating those spaces for conversation, uh, for dialogue, it can, you know, there can be return on that. So I think that's one part of it. And there's, um, again, that involves everybody being at the table or everybody being invited to the table. But then there's other times where I think it can't be understated the importance of having spaces and affinity spaces that are specific to somebody's identity. So, uh, for example, you might have a, a session, a listening session where you're addressing police brutality, right? And I'm speaking from my, you know, black 
lens here and the lens of a black man, a session like that, I may not feel as comfortable sharing everything that I want to share in that shared space and mixed group uh, in the company of white folks, right? Because there's just some things that are just going to be true to my experience. And that's where it becomes so important to have an affinity space that's really tailored for um, the experiences, the voices, uninterrupted for Black and Brown folks. Um, again, to kind of be that peer support group, if you will, inside of an organization where folks can can have that respite to, to, to speak and talk to each other and um, support each other. And the same goes for other identities. So whether it's, you know, people with disabilities, um, you know, tenured employees who have been there seven plus, eight plus years, um, there's a lot of different ways to create these affinity spaces, depending on your organization, the size, the demographics. But again, it can't go understated in terms of the importance and the impact that uh, spaces like that can have. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree with you. I've seen that firsthand myself in listening sessions and focus groups with clients of having a shared experience around, you know, for folks that identify as black, um, for folks that identify as disabilities, we've done sessions with just middle managers and right. what lens are they bringing to the conversation is it's often a demographic we leave out of the DEI conversation to your point. Yeah. an experience for folks that experience the marginalization and for folks that you know probably want to be better allies and don't know how, and we can take that data, code it, theme it, give the organization back some specific action items to take that are based on real lived experiences inside the organization. Cause you can only imagine, you know, that policing conversation you mentioned is so fragile. Like how do we create spaces where people can process things? And you're right. The, the grind capitalist culture teaches us to just keep that stuff, you know, yeah. back here. And we've learned that the, one of the silver linings of COVID is we've learned that people were never quite doing that and certainly right. are no longer doing that. I mean, I can't imagine like someone gets pulled over on the way to work. Like they're not leaving that behind. And right. even if it happened years ago, it's an experience that shaped your, your experiences. And so right. it's something to be honored um, and not necessarily for public consumption. Like you said, too, it, it depends on the audience for those stories and we got to create those safe places I wonder, Stephen, thinking specifically about DEI leaders right now, I'm I'm worried about burnout. Um, we know the data says average tenure is less than two years because folks aren't properly resourced, supported, engaged. I'm feeling the burnout, quite frankly, as a outside practitioner having done this work for eight years. But I wonder for you, like, how might connection help? with DEI leaders right now, or what, what other things might help with some of this burnout that's going on? Sometimes not focusing on the work can help you to refocus on the work. Um, there's a Instagram account I follow, the NAP ministry. So <laughs> shout out to the, the NAP ministry, but the whole premise of the NAP ministry is rest being a form of resistance. So sometimes doing absolutely nothing can help do everything for you, right? Especially black and brown folks. Um, so I, I would say to not underestimate the power of just taking a pause and whether, and again, for that faith-based lens that might uh, in, include praying, for others it might include meditation, but first on an intrapersonal level, just connecting with yourself, like connecting with what's going on and being able to name what's happening in your body uh, with your blood pressure, with your heart rate. I mean, uh, your breathing, right? I mean, so that connectedness to, to self, uh, first and foremost, can't be understated. And then again, finding folks that you can rest with and you can be in community with to, uh, you know, do absolutely nothing. Just, I mean, shoot the breeze. I mean, it may uh, be, you know, doing an activity together, uh, going for a walk. Uh, a jog. I mean, there's so many ways to to connect with folks. And I think, again, going back to your, uh, you alluded to COVID earlier and when we were shut down, I mean, we figured out ways to connect and new ways to connect, you know, virtually. Um, so I would say that um, that there, there's so much importance to being able to connect in that way as well in terms of, um, you know, doing things that sometimes don't require you to use 
that part of your brain and heart, if you will, in terms of thinking about the oppression or the oppressive systems that we're all a part of and, you know, being able to just focus on the joy in your life or, or focus on what brings you joy, what brings you peace. Um, there's a lot of power, I think, um, in doing that and a lot of power that can be generated from from taking up practices like that. So, Rest is a form of resistance. I like that. I like that. Did I, yeah, did I, I get that right? I, yes. And I can't, I cannot take credit for that. Like I say, if uh, for your listeners, if they're not all, already following the NAP ministry, it's done wonders for me as far as just the approach to how to uh, think about and rethink about rest. And, yeah. um, you know, I don't want to do it a disservice. So, uh, yeah, I would encourage folks to follow. the NAP yeah. ministry, <laughs> the yes. NAP ministry. And I would, <laughs> I would encourage folks to follow that because, uh, yeah, it's the, the practices and um, just the insights in terms of rethinking, again, that grind culture and rethinking mm-hmm. you know, our orientation to to work. I mean, you saw this whole thing with quiet quitting, right? You know, mm-hmm. the whole phenomenon around like quiet quitting and that's part of the reason. I mean, it's because people are tired and everybody needs to just take a beat. And, um, you know, I know that comes with a certain level of an advantage to be able to do that. Right. And uh, depending on um, even then the, the group that you're a part of, if you're in the dominant group, you might have more spaces to be able to take a rest versus those who are in subjugated groups, which is why it's so important to be intentional about the creation of those spaces to be able to do it. So. Yeah. 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 So, so I I love the word intentional. I think this work has to be intentional. The formation of these safe spaces that you're talking about, these open spaces have to be intentional and we need to be intentional with our bodies. There is only so much time in a day. And in particular DEI work, I I often say like the eight hour day is probably more like six hours for a DEI person. That's even sometimes stretching it. I mean, these conversations are heavy Yes. They're hard. There's no easy solution. Right. People are struggling. There is pain. I mean, it's it's a lot. And once we can unpack these things, we can really be more, but we need to give ourselves that space and that grace mm-hmm. to refill and recharge. And Connection is such a critical part of the human experience, finding ways to connect folks. Um, one thing that we're excited about, just sidebar here, um, in the next pivot point business, we're doing like a change makers group. So we're getting seven different DEI leaders from different organizations together to just we just kicked off and they are sharing just beautiful things about, you know, it's just me and my organization doing this and my budget got cut. Or Hey, I thought I had everyone on board and the senior leadership team was like, put your money where your mouth is. I need an ROI on this. It's like just these really alienating experiences, but the camaraderie, seeing them come together. Um, And the irony is, you know, it falls on women of color shoulders so often, which you and I, those are not our identities, but, you know, those intersectional dynamics that come together, we just expect women of color to carry this load, the heavy load of their identities, as well as doing the DEI work, which is always puzzling for me. So I think these safe spaces are just so critical for connection amongst DEI folks. Stephen, I wonder, you know, when folks get together, when you get together with other DEI folks, what are some of the things y'all talk about? Like, what are the things that help with uh, the restorative piece? Well, I mean, the first thing we talk about is diagnosing what we feel and being able to put language to what exactly we're going through. Um, I'm a fan of hip hop music, (laughs) Jay-Z. I use this quote often, uh, but you can't heal what you never reveal, right? So the first part is just to be able to reveal what it is that we're experiencing. Some of us are experiencing burnout. Some of us are experiencing racism. Some of us are experiencing uh, homophobia. Some of us are experiencing ableism, um, ageism. So Being able to name that is one of the things we talk about a lot of times. And then again, talking about what are those pockets of joy and where are we finding opportunities to um, reinvigorate ourselves? And again, it may be doing something or it may be what are we not doing or what are we putting down so that we don't have to uh, carry this additional burden, if you will. So those those are some of the conversations that we're having. And then on a 
a little bit of a more strategic level, what we've been spending time, I think about one of the groups that I'm a part of, we've been spending a lot of time thinking about, again, going back to this idea around intentionality, how can we be intentional about the types of clients we want to work with? And uh, being able to chart where are they at as far as clients, where are they at on their journey? Are they doing DEI, sometimes DEIA? Um, are they doing it to check the box or are they really committed to transformative work? Um, and what can that look like in terms of assessing their level of not so much readiness, but their desire and commitment to want to do what they're doing for um, valid and correct reasons um, and meaningful reasons, if you know, if nothing else. So that's something else that we've been having conversations around as practitioners is, you know, we have this, we got to eat, you know, we got to make our money. And at the same time, we have to be able to do this work in a way that remains true and authentic to who we are. So yeah. Yeah. we're having a lot of conversations around what does that look like in practice? Mm -hmm. so. I just had that conversation with a group of DA practitioners and we're all feeling the burnout and the budget constraints. And it's like, yeah, we got to double down on the organizations that are committed. And it, they, by no means, I don't think you or I are saying like, you have to have done all the things like actually probably better if you haven't, but you've thought about a strategy or willing to think about the strategy. You're willing to be intentional and consistent with beyond these celebration months. And, you know, there's just some warning signs you start to see pretty quickly yeah. for the ones that don't get it and don't want to get it. And, uh, that's where the fallout's happening. It's hurtful. It's hurtful yeah. to pour yourself into the work and have people not genuinely care about it. So right, right. really focusing on folks that are committed. All right. And, you know, Julie, one thing I'll add is just kind of just to name what I did earlier. I mean, as far as calling and naming resources, right, and naming, you know, who are you following on Instagram or social media or what books are you reading? I think sometimes we have this issue where as DEI consultants or just workplace culture consultants, organizational development consultants, where we we get so tied up in marketing ourselves. And again, it goes back to that individualistic mentality that we don't put on for other groups or other people who are out here doing work and other um, you know initiatives that are happening. And I think we could break that pattern collectively mm -hmm. in order to just you know uh, co-sign what other people are doing. And um, I think there's a power in being able to do that and, and building that, you know, coalition of sorts where it's not just about, oh, the LLC that I'm a part of, or the LLC that I have, but let's direct folks to, you know, this is what this uh, Black woman is doing in her space, or this is what uh, this person, this business owner mm -hmm. with a disability is doing in their space, or this is what this veteran owned uh, business has got going on in the DEI space. So I think there's an opportunity for us to do a better job of being uh, coordinated in how we uh, support and amplify mm -hmm. each other's work in yeah. this space. I think there's, and I, I'm guilty of that myself. I don't, I don't do the best job I could of, of doing that, but I think it's something that we, we talk about in our spaces and we're continuing to look at how can we I love that create idea. Those, yeah, create those coalitions and partnerships. Among when it people. feels good to help somebody else and amplify their message too, For especially sure. if it, they're of an identity that you're not. Uh, and so you can speak into their experience without claiming you know, to have had that experience. Exactly. Yeah, it feels good to do that. I love that as a tangible idea. Let's promote each other and lift each other up. And right. I do think too, the great thing about story sharing is people are looking for specifics. Like, well, what am I supposed to do to attract people with disabilities? Like, all right. And like, I could give you 20 ideas. It's still not going to be good enough. Here's a story that illustrates what an organization did or what a leader did. Yeah. Uh, and that's part of why I love doing this podcast because this collection of stories can spur other stories and hopefully more momentum. But yeah, I think it feels daunting. Like we're not changing the world fast enough. Right. Face right. and focusing on those microcosms is looking for the positives rather than our negative wired brains looking for the yeah. negatives. It's easy yeah. to find those. It's harder to turn on the positives. Right. Ah, uh, Steven, this is great. Um, I think you've inspired me to take a nap <laughs> later today <laughs> to rest. I love that. And also to lift each other up to connect and find more community and connection here in the DEI world. 
Um, tell our listeners, where can they follow your work? Yeah. So LinkedIn, I'm on LinkedIn, Stephen Graves. Uh, you may see an MHA afterwards. So again, shout out to um, my MUSC family. I got my, That's where I got my master's from. So Stephen Graves um, on LinkedIn. And then uh, one of the collection, collectives that I'm a part of, All In Consulting. Um, so that's allinconsulting.co. And um, we're a, a collective of uh, OD practitioners, so organizational development practitioners, DEI practitioners, talent management uh, consultants. And yeah, we support each other. We support clients um, on this journey of, of change management and DEI and organizational culture. So yeah, they can follow me there as well. So um, yeah, but I'm glad to, to have the opportunity to be a part of this conversation today. Same, Stephen. I'm taking away a lot from the conversation, really positive energy and uh, thankful for the work that you do. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this week's episode. If you like what you heard, consider hiring Julie and the Next Pivot Point team to come speak at your organization's next event. We speak on a range of topics from active allyship to inclusive leadership to how to create a culture where everyone feels seen, heard, and feels a sense of belonging. Thank you for being on this journey with us. Go to nextpivotpoint.com to learn more.